on the basis of the carbon mass that is sequestered, not the CO2 mass. Storing carbon implies roughly, say, let's say, 1,000-year containment with 95% certainty or, or some other factors such as that. And of course, doing it economically. And the current focuses tend to be using it for EOR for obvious reasons. Uh, and the major focus for large scale CO2 sequestration is to pump CO2 into good quality saline, saline aquifers. The uh, degree of certainty of containment remains an issue. And we all are familiar with the, some of the famous diagrams that move from gaseous uh, to, uh, to uh, supercritical to in solution to solid methods of, of uh, carbon sequestration with a, the general acceptance that uh, solid methods are essentially completely secure and dissolved in the saline water methods are highly secure supercritical and gaseous phase storage are less secure because there are buoyancy issues, there are viscosity issues, and of course there are some uh, issues such as the uh, surface effects, uh, the potential stripping of water from, uh, from high porosity shales, uh, chemical interactions. So let's look beyond the uh, conventional approaches and uh, see if there's some other unconventional approaches that might interest someone. Carbon comes in many forms. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner here, you see the, uh, the new evil, the burning of coal, which we're all trying to stop in the world and replace with other methods of generating electrical power. Uh, Perrier water is another form of uh, carbon dioxide uh, sequestration or carbon sequestration. But we all know that the solubility of uh, carbon dioxide in water is quite constrained in terms of uh, mass, uh, mass dissolved in the water under pressure and temperature. Uh, we live in a bio world and all of our biological materials are carbon rich. An example is wood waste. A more interesting example that I'll get back to is biosolids. And of course, we have the ultimate, if we could possibly store carbon in a mineral form that is extremely stable. So some issues, gaseous CO2, of course, low capacity, high buoyancy. The buoyancy means that there's always a gravitationally driven tendency to move upwards and to move through seals, which raises the issue of cap rock integrity and many other issues. In supercritical CO2, uh, it's buoyant, low viscosity, compressible, etc. But if you do a little calculation, for example, let's assume a 15% porosity reservoir and 50% displacement efficiency uh, for supercritical CO2 injection, one cubic meter of the reservoir only contains between 12 and 15 kilograms of carbon. That's why we need huge volumes. Now, suppose that we dissolve it in water, which I said earlier is far safer, but of course it's chemically reactive. There's a it's carbonic acid, we're lowering the pH massively, but le leaving that aside, in a 15 porosity reservoir, even if we get 100% saturation of CO2 of all the water at 15 megapascals and 40 degrees Celsius, that's only three to four kilograms of carbon per cubic meter of volume. Wow, uh, that shows you how big volumes we need to sequester significant amounts. And I'm speaking carbon here, not carbon dioxide. Again, as somebody said, multiply by 44 over uh, 12 and you'll get the mass of carbon dioxide. Now as a solid, uh, the uh, sequestration is considered to be completely secure, either as carbon or as a mineral phase that is uh, carbon rich. So I've shown you that uh, we have limits in sandstones uh, and other, other 
rock types. And some places in the world, we can find sandstones at the right depth range that are very porous, up to 25 to 28% porosity. But in general, our sandstones are, are 15 to 20% porosity. And as shown many times in this conference by excellent presentations, uh, trying to get another fluid into a sandstone means we have a range of flow instabilities. Maybe we can exploit these instabilities positively, but they nonetheless exist, such as capillary blocking, gravity segregation, viscous fingering, and channeling. And you can see here in the macro scale, uh, we, we have our issues. Uh, you can see that the coarse grain to fine grain uh, uh, sections are seen in this, in this outcrop photo. Uh, some sections are heavily cemented, other sections uncemented. And this heterogeneity, of course, leads to uh, a degradation in our ability to store materials. So let's look at method one. Uh, this is a version of WAG, uh, alternating supercritical CO2 injection and water injection into a reservoir. So this is a forced advection method. And when you inject one agent, uh, sorry, one phase, such as a supercritical CO2 into an, uh, an aquifer, you're going to develop a transition zone. In this transition zone, uh, where the saturation uh, of the phases are not equal to one, in other words, there's a mixture of CO2 and H2O, this transition zone grows as we, uh, as we inject because of standard uh, dispersion issues in porous media. But it also gives you an extremely high surface area for dissolution. So if we are to secure the CO2 by dissolving it in water, giving a high degree of sequestration security, we have to inject water episodically and create another transition zone and so on and so forth. Because the large surface area helps us, if we do this correctly, forcing the CO2 into, into solution rapidly. But of course, we've got the gravity drainage issue because gravity segregation tells me that supercritical CO2 is going to rise, whereas uh, wastewater being somewhat more dense is going to drop in the, in the formation. So the specific array of wells and the injection strategy remain to be optimized. Method number two, enrich flue gas injection. And by flue gas, I mean the uh, gaseous product from some uh, coal combustion or natural gas combustion or uh, cement manufacturing operation where we have gone through a relatively cheap stripping of some of the nitrogen, maybe 90% of the nitrogen, but getting to pure CO2 is, 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 is expensive. And as we all know, if we have even only 10% nitrogen in the, in the CO2 uh, as a gaseous mixture, we can't get that into the supercritical condition under our normal reservoir conditions. Uh, we can, the, the, the nitrogen uh, stops us in that regard. Well, if you bubble CO2 uh, enriched flue gas, in other words, say 80, 90% CO2 plus some nitrogen into a vessel uh, of a pore that contains a porous medium with water under pressure, the gas will tend to rise, but the CO2 will go into solution much faster than the, than the nitrogen. The nitrogen will, will tend to go to the top and be, uh, be collected as a cap. So the nitrogen rich or maybe almost pure nitrogen cap rock that may uh, develop uh, can be released into the atmosphere. The CO2 stays behind in solution safely sequestered. So we've done some math on this. Uh, I can forward you some of the papers. Uh, and develop some new semi-analytical solutions that are allowing us to uh, track and map and uh, model the transition zone in a very simple geometry, flat lying, uniform thickness reservoir. But it does tell us uh, what we can do and what we can't do in terms of forcing solution. These are just isosats or, or isosaturation contours uh, that develop uh, above and around a horizontal, long horizontal well injecting supercritical CO2 into a reservoir. And then of course, we also have some uh, solutions for uh, the episodic uh, injection of water. 
this is the radial case as opposed to a linear case and you can see the transition zone that is developed from uh, uh, 100 percent uh, co2 well actually not 100 percent 80 percent co2 in the very middle to uh, 100 percent water in the white area so we also want to dispose of wastewater so co-disposal is good in other words we're going to have to get rid of that wastewater anyway alternating the phases creates a wide transition zone good mixing excellent dissolution behavior, and a buoyant low density gas cap is avoided. Another uh, approach, here I'm using a vertical well, but we can have horizontal wells, uh, that I mentioned, the flue gas uh, enrichment, uh, where we are injecting the gaseous, uh, sorry, the supercritical phase, and we're creating forced advection because of the buoyancy of the, of the gaseous phase. So if we can exploit that, as in this case, uh, we, we see the, the uh, bubbles rising to the surface and becoming stripped of the nitrogen. Uh, we, uh, we can create this kind of like continuing forcing of the advective regime to, uh, to increase our exposure of the saline water to the gaseous mixture so we can strip out the CO2 uh, and, and store it in the water uh, essentially permanently. So that's my forced advection cells here. There we go. So we call that enriched flue gas injection. And uh, the math suggests it's going to work. Uh, but of course, the reality is that we have heterogeneity, etc. There are certain advantages because we don't have to take out all the nitrogen to get supercritical CO2. Here's the method that I really think is, uh, is cool. And it's, it's, it's been done on a trial basis at a large scale in Los Angeles. Biosolids injected along with wastewater. Now this has to be done at hydraulic fracture pressures. In the ground, methanogenic bacteria digest the organic material partially, creating methane carbon dioxide, which stays in solution because it's much, much more soluble than, than methane, and solid carbon rich residue. This is like making coal, only we're accelerating it because we're injecting a, a a rich solution down at depth. And there's methanogens everywhere at depth, by the way. We don't have to spike our biosolids with bacteria. They exist everywhere. Uh, the CO2 stays in solution. The carbon-rich residue now is permanently sequestered with essentially total security. We're just creating beds of coal, if you wish to look at it that way. And you can even harvest the CH4, the methane, uh, because it, it is going to segregate gravitationally and recover some energy from the methane. Uh, the calculations for uh, pure carbohydrates suggest that about 16% uh, of the mass of the pure carbohydrate ends up as methane and the rest as CO2 and solid carbon. Uh, this is a configuration. Can we yes. see uh, uh, just 30 seconds or a minute to wrap it up? Okay, this is the carbon dioxide. Sorry, this is the biosolids injection site in Los Angeles a few years ago. The final method, if we can find a, a liquid that is denser than water, denser than saline aquifer water, such as if you could make carbon disulfide very cheaply, it would be much, much more stable than any other injection process because it is negatively buoyant. It will sink. This is carbon disulfide. And as you can see in the Syncrude site in Canada, we've got waste sulfur and waste carbon and waste CO2, of course. So in summary, unconventional approaches exist, uh, forcing rapid dissolution advectively, injecting of cheap uh, liquids that are rich in carbon, but most important to my view is biosolids. We all generate wastes. Every big city in Saudi Arabia and around the world that is on a sedimentary basin should consider biosolids as a means of sequestering carbon, as well as treating their wastes. And I want to point out that we will never run out of biosolids to inject. So thanks to all of you and to uh, my, my session chairman. Uh, that's my presentation. Thank you, Professor Maurice. Uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Philip Neal from TNO. And uh, he will be discussing uh, reusing depleted hydrocarbon fields